So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to express our very warm welcome to our sixth HHL Expert Talk. First of all, I am very delighted to see so many of you here tonight, and I hope you've all been having a wonderful week. For those of you who are here for the very first time, I wanted to give you a short explanation of what is the HHL Expert Talk and why exactly are we doing this? The HHL Expert Talk is a virtual talk series with which HHL aims to address latest key topics in research to broaden the knowledge transfer on current social, economic, and political topics led by HHL experts. So to briefly introduce myself. My name is Sigrid Fischer and I am delighted to be moderating the HHL Expert Talk series. I studied journalism and psychology at Indiana University in the US and continued with a Master's of Science in Performance Psychology at the University of in, in Edinburgh, uh, where I also worked on later on in my career. At HHL, I'm now responsible for the alumni network. Before we're heading into tonight's talk, I would like to give you a very brief overview of HHL's facts and figures. HHL was established more than 120 years ago here in Leipzig, Germany. It is our mission to educate entrepreneurial, responsible, and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research, and practice. We're driven by excellence to benefit our students, stakeholders, and society. So where exactly are we today? Today, we have more than 700 students in our five programs, and these five programs are our full-time and part-time master's, master's uh, in management, our full-time and part-time MBA, our PhD program is our fifth program. We have more than 60 nationalities amongst our student body and we're proud to have more than 2,700 alumni in our network. As an entrepreneurial driven university, we're particularly proud that more than 300 startups were co-founded or founded by HHL alumni and five of these are actually unicorns, so startups with a value of more than 1 billion US dollars. We are also very happy to have 130 partner universities across the world. It is now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's expert, Professor Dr. Smolinski. Professor Smolinski graduated with a PhD from HHL Leipzig Graduate School of Management with a research focusing on theory and practice of negotiation, particularly in international settings. He was a visiting scholar at Tufts University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and at Harvard's program on negotiation. He also visited and researched at Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University and Sichuan University in Chengdu, China. He worked as an assistant professor for negotiation at the IESEG School of Management and a research associate at Aarhus University. Having built and managed Eastern European marketplaces at mobile.de, he led a team responsible for driving e-commerce innovations at Otto Group and worked as VP Business Development and Innovation Management at Comdirect Bank. He holds an honorary professorship at HHL and is the founder of the Negotiation, Negotiation Challenge, a major international student negotiation competition. I will now hand over to Remy, and for everybody um, who is staying for longer, we will have a Q&A session afterwards. So please type in your question into our chat as we would like to keep everybody on mute so that our event runs most smoothly. I'm now handing over and all there is to say is enjoy tonight. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for uh, for for the kind invitation. I'm uh, I'm uh, humbled with, at your interest in uh, in the area of my research and in my great passion. Um, and uh, I would like to start by uh, sharing my screen. I, I do uh, hope that it works out. Let us see. Um, there's always there's always a an uncertainty when it comes to technology. But let us uh, let us. See. All right. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. I'm relieved. Okay. Awesome. So first step. Uh, uh, first step behind us. All right. So um, what I would like to talk to you guys about is um, is uh, is uh, some of the some of the challenges, some of the dilemmas that we faced um, uh, working with in the area of negotiation, especially running negotiation competitions. Yeah? And um, 
the fundamental question uh, that we started asking ourselves at some point uh, before and during uh, while running the competition was uh, how can we distinguish, how can we assess and compare negotiators' performance? In other words, uh, how can we distinguish those who are great from those who are excellent and those maybe who are just at the beginning of it? Okay? Um, and as we will, as we will find out uh, soon, uh, there is not so much research done on this highly fundamentally important topic, uh, and uh, we decided to tackle it uh, uh, with uh, one of our projects. Before we, however, before we come to uh, before we come to the scientific part, eh, I would like you guys to grab your mobile phones, unless you are obviously listening to me on your mobile phones, and uh, check whether we can do something with uh, something that is interactive. Here, eh? Um, uh, you guys can uh, go to slide.do yeah, in a browser, whichever one you prefer, Google, Safari, or whatever one, whichever one you're using. And uh, once you see a slider window, you just type HHL as an event code. Uh, I, now I see that it doesn't work, which is not good. Hmm. I don't know why, but uh, apparently this doesn't work. So we'll have to switch to a backup plan. And why don't you share in your comments where you guys are from? I would be also uh, I would be totally interested in uh, in finding out uh, uh, in finding out where you guys are um, are located right now. All right. So, so um, what are the goals for today? Uh, my intention is to challenge a little bit your uh, your intuition or our intuition in terms of uh, in terms of uh, um, our understanding of negotiator, negotiators' performance, how we measure it, how we compare it. Uh, um, I'm curious to find out your thoughts, what you thought about uh, while you were uh, signing up and logging into uh, to this meeting. Uh, we will look at a couple of individuals who uh, commonly and widely are considered, uh, considered to be uh, great negotiators. And uh, uh, I'll share with you guys some thoughts on uh, what we believe are the dimensions uh, of uh, along which we can cap we can capture and uh, and uh, compare negotiators' performance? And obviously, there will be a slight short commercial break or commercial announcement. Uh, I will obviously talk a little bit about uh, something that we uh, that we created uh, a couple of years ago, and that's the negotiation challenge. All right, so I have sad news for you guys. <laughs> really sad news. Uh, unfortunately. You will, you will not become great negotiators uh, after seeing this presentation. But you might have a better idea along about uh, what it takes to become better, eh? what it takes to deliver better performance in, in your negotiations. But uh, it might be just uh, another step on your road uh, to mastery, to achieving mastery and on your road to excellence. All right, moving on. I promised to start with intuition, and apparently this won't work with Slido. Um, well, let's see now. It won't work. With, oh, yeah. this will work with Slido. Awesome. All right. So we will uh, please grab your mobile phones. This uh, seems to be working. The second question, um, uh, which means uh, when you think about great negotiators, uh, contemporary or historical, eh, who comes, uh, what names uh, pop into your mind? Eh? Uh, any individuals um, from Obama? I see Obama, I see Churchill, all right. So, um, Churchill mentioned several times, Trump, Trump, okay, all right. Nixon, uh, Angela Merkel, all right, Barack Obama, Herb Cohen, um, Chris Voss, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Kennedy, Kissinger, all right, Remy. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, for this uh, recognition. Uh, completely undeserved. All right, Angela Merkel seems to be indeed someone who has uh, received, who's been receiving a lot of uh, a lot of votes right now. And uh, but we have also and we have also uh, other names uh, which uh, have left have left a footmark uh, in history, either contemporary or or um, more distant. All right, uh, if we move on, uh, all right, we're getting some more votes, all right. 
that uh, starts uh, looking really cool. Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, Pope Francis, Adenauer. Okay. Awesome. All right, thank you guys for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, I looked back, uh, I looked at, uh, at a couple of individuals uh, and I would like to share with you uh, some names. I don't know whether you guys are familiar with uh, this individual, not so well known, but, uh, but, maybe, but maybe some of you are. Anyone knows? Anyone knows in the chat window? Anyone else? That's Talleyrand. That's Talleyrand. Talleyrand is a, is a really interesting individual, considered by many, especially those uh, who are active in diplomacy or political science, considered as one of the greatest negotiators of all time. Okay? And the reason is because uh, his career, or, and at the same time, obviously, as a symbol of uh, cynical diplomacy. Okay? And the reason behind it is because this gentleman managed to start his career as a, in the foreign services of uh, Louis XVI, okay? then survived him, kept his position during the French Revolution, okay? when heads were falling left and right. So, uh, then, when French Revolution faded away, he was also the foreign minister for Napoleon. And when Napoleon lost his uh, bloody wars uh, and uh, was stranded on Elba, he also he assumed a position in the in the in the, in the court of Louis the Eighteenth. Okay? So that's uh, that's it takes a lot of skills, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure whether cynicism. Some uh, some political scientists uh, claim that it's also required, but uh, it takes uh, it takes a lot of that uh, to uh, advance uh, uh, advance a career through all these regimes so radically different. Each of them so radically radically different and so and so opposing. Okay? All right, so, um, moving on, the second gentleman, I'm sure is known, for, known uh, to many. Yeah? Uh, and uh, some of you guys, uh, some of you, you guys have crowned him with the name with the, of, great, of the great negotiators. That, that's Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma is, by the way, not his real name. That's the title, and the honorable, honored soul. Uh, that's Mahatma Gandhi, right? So known for Known, uh, um, um, known for his anti-colonial uh, movement in India, non-violent uh, resistance and so on. And then I also have uh, the third one who has also left a significant, uh, significant footprint in our history, in the history of, especially in the United States, this Israel, United States. And I think it doesn't, uh, it's not a secret that's, that's a picture of, uh, of Martin Luther King, right? Uh, uh, I think now more important than, than ever, right? Uh, all lives matter. Uh, something that we are we've been hearing for the last uh, for the last couple of uh, couple of weeks, right? So, uh, so we have a diplomat, we have a lawyer, and we have a minister, yeah? and each of them has unquestionable unquestionable uh, achievements. Uh, each of them certainly can be uh, can be. Uh, can be crowned uh, as, or can be considered as a, as a great negotiator. Okay? So, and if we move to a little bit more contemporary times, I selected these three for you guys, uh, right? Uh, I think uh, one of them is no surprise. Uh, um, and uh, Angela Merkel was considered also by many of you as, an, as a great negotiator. And I think she is uh, for many, many reasons. More about it, uh, more about it later on. Uh, same goes for Barack Obama, someone who managed to, uh, someone who managed to, to unite uh, to unite the United States, if that's uh, if that's uh, not an oxymoron, and uh, Donald Tusk, all of them are architects of uh, of the modern of the modern world, okay? Germany, Europe, or um, the U.S. So now I think what is interesting is um, to ask ourselves how do we define greatness? You guys remember the title the title of this presentation was. Uh, um, in search or how to become a great negotiator. But uh, to, be, to be able to answer how, we first of all have to understand what, that, what, what greatness means. Yeah? So I prepared a couple of slides for you guys to uh, somehow, somehow um, battle a little bit or struggle with the question of greatness. Yeah? Um, anyone knows this gentleman? The Greek freak? 
flying for Milwaukee Bucks. Yes, Yanis Antetokounmpo, thank you so much, right? So why do I have him on my slides if we're supposed to talk about negotiation, right? So, um, Yanis Antetokounmpo was, uh, was selected uh, to, uh, to 2009 uh, NBA MVP, most valuable, most valuable player in the national, uh, by the National Basketball Association in the United States. Yeah? Um, I will spare you guys the details, but uh, in sports, it seems uh, that in sports, it's fairly easy to do, right? Because we have, uh, uh, we have the statistics, we can, we, we can easily see how many, uh, how many minutes he played, how many games he won, how many shots he made, how many points he scored, and so on and so on. And the same goes for, obviously, uh, Robert Lewandowski, who will probably become uh, the best soccer player of the uh, of this highly disrupting, uh, disrupted season, right, the, uh, this year, with uh, over a 30 score scold in uh, German Bundesliga, right? So, so um, <clears throat> it's fairly easy when we have the statistics and still people differ in their opinions. Is it Giannis Antetokounmpo? Is it maybe LeBron James? Uh, same debate, uh, same debate. We witnessed, we witnessed the same debate uh, um, um, during the, uh, the broadcasting of the show, which I'm, I'm sure you guys, uh, oh, you guys must have, uh, must have uh, uh, seen the last dance. So is it, uh, was Michael Jordan really the greatest of all time? Or is it maybe LeBron James? The numbers seem to speak for LeBron, LeBron James, but people tend to like uh, Michael Jordan uh, more. So sports, in sports, we have statistics, right? We, can, we have statistics, we can look at the numbers and still for some, uh, it's, uh, it's not so convincing. But we, when we move on to something which is more difficult to capture in data, such as, for example, figure skating or ice dancing. Eh? Um, those of you guys who, uh, who um, were born like myself uh, somewhat earlier than others uh, might, remember, might remember the lady on the, on the left of my screen, that's Katharina Witt or Witz, uh, born in Eastern Germany, two-time uh, two Olympic medalist, uh, um, a high performer, high achiever, one of the greatest uh, figure skaters of, uh, of all times. Okay? Um, and these two, um, Jane Torville, Christopher Dean, uh, something for Jonathan from, uh, from Great Britain, right? Uh, uh, excellent ice dancers, excellent ice dance dancers who are known for something that no one had achieved before, nor at any point in the uh, afterwards. Yeah? Yes, they danced to Bolero and they received all sixes as the only couple in the history of ice dancers. Why do I quote these two or these four um, as examples of greatness? Because even if we don't have the data, eh, even if the judgment on performance is based on, on other things, eh, such as, I don't know, technical merit or artistic impression, such as in uh, figure skating or ice dancing, it's still possible that uh, possible to distinguish or to tell Katarina Witt was better than others, or Jane Torville and Christopher Dean deserve all sixes, right, for their performance um, um, in Sarajevo, I think, Olympics, right? So, so that's, uh, that's something encouraging when it, comes to, when it comes to negotiation, because negotiation is partly science and partly art, as, uh, as you, some of you might know from a very famous, very famous book uh, of uh, Howard Reifer. Uh, who was a mathematician, uh, but uh, I think for a, for, a, for a big chunk of his career, dealt with uh, the question of how to negotiate better. Yeah? Okay, and then I wanted to play something for you guys. Uh, anyone knows who this gentleman is? If not, I will give you, I will give you a hint. Let me see if it works. I wouldn't be surprised if, it's, uh, if it didn't, but... Uh, all right, that's indeed, uh, indeed, let me see, I don't know why, but this is, uh, I wanted to uh, play something for you, and I'm not sure if you guys can hear this. This is uh, Toccata and Fuke um, uh, and Demo, right? So that's, uh, uh, why am I, why am I, um, why, why do I have Johann uh, Sebastian Bach here on my slide? Eh? Uh, I'm sure you guys know this piece, so I will spare you the, the, the further, further details. 
um, several reasons. Uh, the experts in music history consider him the greatest uh, musician of all time, the greatest composer of all time. Okay? And the second reason is because um, most of his career he spent in Leipzig, <laughs> not far from uh, not far from Hotel. So that's Johann Sebastian Bach. And then we have this gentleman, uh, probably familiar only to those uh, who are located in Germany. That's, uh, that's Dieter Bowen, right? Producer, composer, the founder of Modern Talking, right? So, uh, and uh, obviously, if we ask those who are present in this call, probably most of you guys would claim that uh, uh, it's Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, who, uh, who is the greatest uh, musician of all times, rather than Dieter, Dieter Bohlen. But we do know, probably all of us uh, have someone in our network uh, who, is, uh, who is a very, very big fan of modern talking. Yeah? Millions of records sold, millions of records sold in its times. Uh, uh, but uh, if we look at the numbers, uh, at least on YouTube, of the most famous pieces of these two, it seems that greatness and popularity is, uh, do not go hand in hand. Uh, although uh, most of us would say, well, it was Bach, but the Cut and Fugue, 37 million, of, uh, 37 million views, and Modern Talking, you're my, heart, you're my heart, you're my soul. I'm sure you guys know the melody, even if you would probably deny it uh, when asked in public. Um, half a billion, half a billion views, all right? So um, let's, uh, let's transition, let's move back to negotiation. Why is it so interesting? Why is, it, uh, why is uh, defining greatness uh, highly relevant in the context of negotiation? Well, let us start with the observation that uh, some of us, uh, some of us perform significantly better in negotiation than others. Uh, and that is systematically significantly better. And the question is, why is that the case? First of all, how can we tell? And what defines or determines negotiation performance? I think those of you guys who have dealt with, who have dealt with the topic of, um, of negotiation at least a bit, probably one of the, one of the first things that you've seen uh, or heard in negotiation seminar or classes or whatever videos and books, uh, it's uh, how we negotiation scholars like to start our articles, papers and books. And so we say, well, negotiation is a skill. Well, if it weren't, you would have been out of job. Right? Uh, uh, it's well, it's necessary and it's, uh, it's reasonable. Man. Above of all, it is reasonable to define negotiation as a skill similar to sports, dancing, music, I don't know, speaking languages, anything else, uh, because it contains a very important component. Yeah? Obviously, a part of the performance is about our talent. Yeah? What is that uh, that uh, we have certain predisposition uh, to doing, right? What is that uh, um, that uh, we can perform, we can do better than others? Yeah? So each of us has probably different talents, some of us uh, more in music, others in sports and so on, right? So, uh, but uh, we start in different, uh, different point in negotiation. The second component of the, of the definition of a skill is that it's possible to improve it. Okay? It's possible to improve it. And what, the, what is necessary to improve a certain skill are two things, okay? very important things. Yeah? First, repetition. Right? And second, structured feedback. And uh, if, we, if we put it all together, defining negotiation as a skill has, uh, has profound consequences, okay? has profound consequences. If we agree that it's like music, sports, dancing, and so on, then we can measure and compare performance in that area. Okay? And this is something that has, uh, that has kept me busy for many, many years. Uh, I think about 14, 15 years ago, we came up with the crazy idea of, hey, if negotiation is a skill, let us try to capture and yeah, let us try to assess the performance of uh, different negotiators. Let us put them together and try to com compare and determine who is the best negotiator, yeah? who is the greatest negotiator of those uh, that we've tested. So we came up with an idea that some of you might, uh, might be familiar with. It's the negotiation challenge. Uh, initially, for many, many years, we have run it uh, with students. And we've run it with students. To, uh, and it has gathered uh, enormous attention. Enormous attention has always been a fantastic experience uh, for us. Uh, 
as uh, as negotiation professors and all of the, all of people involved, uh, uh, taking us to various countries and uh, putting us in touch uh, uh, with those who are just as passionate about this topic as uh, as we are. Yeah? Uh, but above of all, I think one of the most interesting developments that we are uh, planning to introduce this year is we are planning for the first time to run a negotiation competition for professionals. Yeah? There is absolutely no reason to limit ourselves to students. Yes, yeah, students are more patient and therefore give, uh, forgive us a lot of mistakes, right? So, uh, whereas uh, over the last 15 years, uh, we've made a lot of mistakes, but we also learned a lot. And we would like to share this experience with those of you guys who, for whom negotiation is an important uh, topic and a part of your life. Yeah? So be it uh, regardless of whether you are um, negotiating in diplomatic context, contest, context yeah? uh, or maybe are a business professional, business executive, or maybe negotiate, uh, um, I don't know, in other, in, 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 in other areas. Uh, you are welcome, you are welcome, more than welcome to join. Um, we are open to all hierarchies, all levels, all industries, that's uh, um, agnostic in that sense. Uh, and uh, we promise to share feedback. We promise unforgettable experience meeting other passionate and great negotiators uh, uh, from other industries, uh, other countries, people just like you. Okay. End of the commercial break. Let's move to hard stuff, please. Okay. All right, so uh, <clears throat> I would like to share with you guys uh, a couple of thoughts on um, that uh, we put together um, together with Amelia. Uh, my great uh, graduate student and MBA uh, alumna from uh, from HHL, um, who uh, worked with me on this on this topic and did an extremely good job on it. Um, we tackled we tackled the problem, which is, in our opinion, an extremely important uh, problem to solve for everyone who wants to deal seriously with the with the topic of negotiation in a scientific or pedagogical basis. Yeah? Uh, in other words, how can we tell if someone we see and engage, negotiate with, is doing a good job in the negotiations or not? Yeah? Or how can we tell, it's a variation of this question, how can we tell that we, as negotiation professors, negotiation instructors, coaches, trainers, and so on, are doing a good job? And ultimately, there is, if there is no measure of negotiation performance, all we can base our judgment, our self-assessment of our pedagogical performance is the feedback that we get. In other words, maybe it's more important to excite people about the topic, uh, right? So, to give them a really cool experience. Uh, but at the end of the day, hmm, who knows whether it helps or not? Yeah? In other words, uh, a very important, uh, very important topic of uh, assessment of the negotiation performance. Eh? Uh, we, uh, Amelia and I, digged into the literature and tried to find uh, uh, find uh, studies, attempts uh, at addressing exactly this question. And what we found out uh, are typ were typically studies that compared the behavior of skilled negotiators with those. Who are, cannot be or couldn't be by certain by a certain set of criteria were not considered as skilled. Yeah? So, in other words, the selection yeah, of whether somebody is skilled, good, great, excellent, achieved the mastery or not was based on predefined criteria. Yeah? And then the studies typically compared if uh, if someone is skilled, he or she does more often of whatever uh, planning, whatever labeling and so on and so on, lots of different studies. Whereas uh, if you aren't skilled, uh, you do less of that. Okay, but this question, uh, this answer was uh, somewhat uh, unsatisfactory to us because uh, our dilemma is how can I tell without knowing the pre-history, without, without knowing the history of that individual, without knowing his or her reputation? How can I know if he or she is performing well or not? in a negotiation. Okay? So in other words, how can I distinguish and determine based on what I see, what I hear, what I perceive, <clears throat> excuse me, how can I disturb, uh, the, the, 
distinguish and determine whether the person I'm observing is doing a good job or not. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we came up with, we, um, uh, we, and that's a different question. That's a different question because we don't know the past history. All we have is the observation of the moment. So um, moving on. Emilia and I um, uh, looked a lot into the literature. And I looked a lot into the literature and uh, found a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting findings uh, um, on observable traits of negotiators that correlate with their performance. Okay? And we did a lot of cataloging, um, grouping, cataloging, classifying, and so on. And uh, at the end of the day, I'll uh, spare you the details, but what we found out or what we decided what, what, what we decided is to cluster those behaviors, those traits into four categories, four meta categories, and about 15 competitors. Okay? So those categories, if we start from the top with language and emotionality, these categories um, start from the most easiest to observe. And then as we move down, uh, they become somewhat harder to distinguish or harder to determine, but still not impossible. Okay? So in other words, uh, uh, when we talk about communication, you guys can see the 15 competencies of my slides. Uh, that's uh, how we exchange information, okay? How we transmit and how we listen, how we perceive. Right? So, um, probably we should have started with listening rather than expression as uh, uh, as uh, in a very famous TEDx talk, uh, Bill Yuri said, we have two of these and one of that, right? So that probably uh, active listening is probably a more important, and that's what other studies also confirm. Uh, listening seems to be more important than, uh, than um, expressing oneself, but both, uh, both uh, deserve a place on that list. Then we have emotions, lots of research done on emotions. Uh, uh, and then there's a huge category which we labeled as negotiation intelligence. Yeah? What is negotiation intelligence? In a nutshell, at some point while organizing the negotiation challenge, we said, uh, hey, uh, who deserves to be called a great negotiator? Who deserves to win a competition? And we decided that uh, a great negotiator is someone who can, who has a wide spectrum, who knows a wide spectrum of negotiation tools and strategies, okay, and can adjust their application to the context, the particular context, and the particular person. Okay? So it's not hard or soft. Uh, it's not uh, value creator versus value claimer. It's someone who can be the best in a given situation or who can optimize the performance. Being the best is probably a, a wrong uh, a wrong statement, who can, who can optimize his uh, or her performance uh, in a particular context or substance, particular substance, and uh, with um, particular um, partners, okay? And as such, we, we added, I think, uh, nine, if I remember correctly, um, uh, competencies there that uh, we believe uh, that belong here. Um, that is understanding the interest, setting the stage, which means make, making the first offer and uh, making a credible first offer uh, managing concessions and so on and so on. You guys can uh, read it on the slide. Okay. Then we said, well, but that's not enough. And ultimately, that's not enough because what matters is the the ability to build rapport, to create, to build trust, to create a sustainable working relationship. Right. Uh, maybe not in all negotiations. Some of them are one shot. Right. But in many, many aren't. And many negotiations just open the possibility of uh, for further interaction. They start relationship between the parties, right? So, so uh, um, uh, we said that trust and relationship building belong to a skill set of a great negotiator, or have to belong to a skill set of a great negotiator. And then the last one, it should probably split into two. Um, uh, I'm sort of, uh, uh, although our, our paper is right now um, being published, I think uh, the first revision, uh, self-critical revision would be that we probably should have uh, split moral wisdom into into uh, empathy and ethics uh, and, uh, and uh, have them separately in our model. But uh, uh, we subsumed it under moral wisdom. That's the bedrock, yeah, uh, based on which how we derive our decisions, how we 
how we uh, how we negotiate, how we treat our partners, uh, the extent to which uh, we believe it's uh, acceptable or not to mislead uh, one way or another by omission or commission. Um, a lot of research done on that. So that's the shape of the model in a nutshell, and that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, that uh, uh, that um, uh, that we um, sort of uh, put together. But that's not enough, and uh, that's not enough because uh, how can I tell based on where is my pointer? How can I tell based on an observation of somebody negotiating? Right? How can I tell whether the quality of expression was a Appropriate. Okay. How can I tell whether that person was listening actively? Or how can I judge whether the way it was done, it's neutral, par, okay, above par, or below par? So we decided, Amelia and I, we decided to come up with uh, behavioral traits. And that's obviously a draft. And I do expect a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, feedback uh, from, uh, from the community and from you guys, uh, uh, of course, as well. Um, because uh, this is meant to trigger the discussion of this top on this topic. Yeah? This is not meant to be. Um, uh, this is not meant to be uh, final. Yeah? This is meant to be an inspiration uh, uh, for the community to start thinking about uh, something that I believe is long overdue, and that is, uh, hey, who deserves uh, who deserves twelve sixes? Uh, for negotiator negotiation performance, yeah? how can we distinguish uh, better from uh, good from better or uh, better from excellent? Right, uh, and this is something that uh, that just like ice skating, on um, just like figure skating, right? We can say, oh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of subjectivity to it. Oh yes, it is. Yes, there is. But still, the ice skating federation, after years, I can imagine of deliberations, was able to say, hey. If we want, if we define this as a skill, as a sport, yeah, if we define it as a sport, people will want to compete. People will want to find out who is a better ice skater or a better figure skater uh, than others. Yeah? And unlike in other sports, uh, sports disciplines, when we have statistics, there we don't. Yeah? So what distinguishes a performance of a of a great ice skater or a figure skater or a great musician? By the way, there are also com there are also com uh, competitions in playing piano. Yeah? The Chopin competition, piano, uh, pianist competition, right? Organized every five years, uh, highly prestigious, prestigious, and same story, same story. The jury has to come up, has to distinguish from all of those who are excellent, which one of them is the best. Yeah? Same goes for negotiation. There is no excuse uh, by saying, well, it's part of it is an art. Yeah? Part of it is an, is an art. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's hard to capture another. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah? Part of uh, uh, part of uh, part of uh, the role plays that uh, that we are using in our in our classes and in competitions are scorable. Then it's easy. Yeah? If it, if a role play is scorable, if it's simplified to one dimension, such as for example, I don't know, price or uh, or salary or whatever else, right? So then it's easy. Then it's easy because uh, then we know. Okay, it's a zero sum. What you get is what I have to uh, uh, what I have to take out of my pocket. And the higher the price, the better it is for the seller, and so on and so on. You guys know that all that just that's trivial. But uh, how do I tell who is a great negotiator in a conflict negotiation when there are no numbers? Where there are no numbers, eh? how can we tell whether uh, negotiator A or B uh, delivers better performance? So these are the these are these, these criteria and observable traits uh, are. Uh, our first, uh, first suggestion, uh, first attempt uh, to tackle this problem, and I'm sure, and I'm sure, if we ever end up uh, with a with a list of uh, of um, officially recognized uh, performance assessment criteria in negotiation or for negotiations, uh, uh, I'm sure they won't look like this. Yeah? Uh, but that's that's fine. That's perfect. I, we we strongly, however, we strongly believe that we need this discussion. Yeah? We need this discussion, and we. Uh, we decided to take a, a first shot at it. Yeah? So I'm not going to go through all these um, all these tables, behavioral traits. Uh, uh, you guys, uh, uh, you guys, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to um, to to reach out to me and uh, have a have a chat about any of them and why we believe uh, that we that they deserve to be there versus others that maybe uh, are not there. 
but uh, I think what is important, uh, what is important, however, uh, and you obviously you will receive a link to uh, to this recording uh, um, in a couple of uh, in a couple of days. But what is important is the so what. Eh? It's the so what. Eh? So hey, thank you so much. You came up with this model, but uh, but what value does it bring? What value does it bring? What can we do with it? Eh? So first of all. And uh, I would like to start with, uh, with self-criticism of uh, me as a, as, a, as a negotiation instructor. I think there are more important issues in teaching negotiation than a good show. Okay? So enjoying the show okay? and, uh, and uh, having a good feeling at the end that, uh, that uh, one or the other negotiation course or seminar or whatever else uh, from one or, or the other vendor, uh, and there are lots of those vendors out there, by the way, yeah? uh, that, uh, that this feeling is what determines the pedagogical value of such seminar. Yeah? Um, so far, none of those seminars have been measured in terms of their ability to improve that performance before and after. And if they have, if they have, they were measured by the most ridiculous criteria I can, uh, I, I, I one could have uh, come up with, and that is the self-reported uplift in negotiation results. Yeah? Uh, I've seen some of the negotiation companies uh, do that. Uh, scientifically speaking, that's not the way it should be done. But anyway, uh, assessing negotiation pedagogy, that's one area, one area in which uh, I think this model could be, uh, could be used. Uh, other areas is um, negotiation competitions. There are more and more. There are more and more of those uh, in the world. And I'm very humbled and delighted if, uh, uh, when, I, when I get to uh, uh, participate uh, in them or have, a, ha have an honor to, uh, to help uh, um, the organizers uh, in their in their in their first years, uh, um, but above all, above all, if we move past the competition, if we move past the pedagogy or commercially offered courses, I think what is important for us, uh, for every, anyone uh, or everyone who is uh, passionate about this subject, is that at some point, uh, that at some point, we 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 are able to organize a world championship in negotiation. And to do that, yeah, and to do that, we need exactly the universal standards that uh, the community would share and support. Yeah? Share and support. All right. Uh, so, a uh, couple more slides, and then I'm done. Yeah? So, okay, okay. I know the model. How can I use it? Okay. Um, I thought about it a lot. Uh, what I could, uh, what I could give you guys, what I could leave you guys with. Uh, and here, I think what is important are three elements, yeah? three elements. First, visualization, second, practice, three, reflection. There is a very famous, very famous paper, yeah? very famous study, very famous experiment, uh, I think from 1996, in which basketball enthusiasts, yeah? you are welcome to switch basketball and negotiation, yeah? As, uh, but in that particular experiment, uh, um, it was all about basketball enthusiasts, basketball players. They were divided into three groups. Yeah? One of them was supposed to, was one of the groups was supposed to practice three throw, uh, free throws, yeah? like the I think Dwayne Dwayne Wade on my on my slide, yeah? practicing them half an hour every day for a week. Okay? The other group was supposed to visualize them themselves throwing free throws, yeah? making those shots, visualize. Yeah? So they were invited to a gym for half an hour, but they didn't get the ball. They didn't touch the ball. They were supposed to sit down or lie down and think about themselves shooting hoops, making free, throw, uh, free throws, okay? And the third group, that's the, you probably guys anticipated correctly, that's the group that didn't have to do anything. That's the lazy group, right? The easiest, uh, the easiest task among the three. So, and guess what? Eh? Those who were able, to, who were asked to practice um, free, for, free, uh, free throws, uh, achieved an uplift of twenty-four percent accuracy. Uplift in accuracy of twenty-four eh? percent. 
as compared to the control groups, uh, to the control group, those uh, who uh, were asked to do nothing, to be lazy. Okay? Funny thing or interesting thing is, however, that those who uh, focused on visualization only and did not touch the ball for a week had an uplift of 23%, okay? one percentage point less only. So visualization, one of the things, uh, and one of the things uh, I very often do before important negotiations, I, I take a minute for myself. Yeah? I, uh, I think about uh, dimensions of a negotiator's performance. Yeah? What is that I want to be like in the, in the upcoming negotiation? Yeah? And then having spent some time thinking about visualizing my own performance and thinking about myself in a particular situation, how would, how would I how would I react? How would I, how would I want to behave? What would I want to demonstrate? And so on. Um, I do hope there is no such, there's, by the way, there is no such study done in, uh, for visualizing negotiation performance. Yeah? Uh, but I can imagine that it can work exactly the same way. So that's the first recommendation, visualization. Yeah? Second practice. Yeah? Negotiation is a skill to become better. You need to repeat it. But repeating it only without structure feedback, that's, uh, that's, um, that can lead to repeating the same mistakes yeah? and have fi fixing certain neural connections, uh, uh, which then might be difficult to, uh, difficult to change. So what we need is someone or something who tells us, okay, if you do this, you can improve your performance. Yeah? But if you do that, you are more likely to achieve worse results. There are lots of opportunities to practice and uh, one of them uh, is uh, something, uh, one of them is something that uh, we will, we have started 14, 15 years ago. That's the negotiation challenge. Uh, uh, for those of you guys who are in the job, join us in September, join us in September. Um, uh, lots of opportunities, lo lots of opportunities to measure yourselves up uh, to those who are the best in the field from various countries, okay? And also we offer, um, H as HHL offers also, uh, great negotiation seminars and uh, one of them is coming uh, coming soon in November. All right, so that's the second visualization practice. What's the third? Reflection. A friend of, uh, a very good friend of mine uh, who uh, from Colombia uh, wrote her uh, PhD thesis on reflection in negotiation, the importance of reflection in negotiation. That's the, that's the feedback loop that is necessary. It's not enough to visualize. It's not enough to practice. It's extremely important to make the comparison to the reference point. Okay? Make the comparison to the reference point being either the model or whatever you believe is, uh, should be the reference point for, uh, for your type of negotiation. Okay? So uh, these three, with these three recommendations, I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, leave you guys and open up the floor uh, for questions. Thank you so much, guys, for uh, sticking around for so long, uh, despite the such nice weather, at least in Germany. We have almost 30 degrees today. Uh, and I would be delighted to, uh, to uh, answer your questions. So first of all, thank you, Remy, for the very insightful presentation. And um, I'm trying to read the first question. So anybody who's got a question, um, go ahead and type it into the chat. Oh, here's the first one. And here we go. How does different personality types play a role in this model? For example, can we say that maybe those individuals with balanced qualitative and quantitative skills are more likely to be excellent negotiators versus those that are either great in numbers or great with people? Very good question. Thank you so much, Alejandra, for, um, for, for raising this point. Uh, um, we have not investigated it systematically. Yeah? Uh, and I hate to give you guys, uh, to give you, Alejandra, an intuitive answer because it's, it might be wrong. It might, might be completely off. Yeah? Um, but the reason, for example, the reason why um, we decided to design a competition and both the business one and the student one uh, with, um, uh, with negotiators competing in teams is because there is solid research on, um, on superior performance of teams versus individuals. Okay? There is solid research which says, the more, first of all, if you negotiate in team, 
you're highly likely to achieve better results. Okay? And the more diversified the team, the better the result will be. Okay? So I think it's, uh, um, it's extremely hard. It's extremely hard to, to be a lonely star uh, in that field. Uh, in other words, uh, it might be possible, but it's, uh, it's highly unlikely. Some of you, uh, we all have certain strengths and we all uh, have certain weaknesses. And uh, the, best ways, the best way to optimize uh, that in negotiation is to make sure that we have someone at our side who complements our weaknesses and uh, that we can best, so that we can best focus on the things that we do, uh, uh, that we do, uh, that we do, uh, that we do well. Thank you very much. The second question, um, I would love to get more information on this topic. Is there a good book from you that you can recommend? Uh, okay, so uh, the paper is coming up soon. If you, uh, if you're, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to share uh, our draft, uh, our unpublished draft. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of, re you'll find in the paper, you'll find lots of references, uh, um, uh, lots of references, uh, me and myself, we dug uh, pretty deep uh, into, uh, into research on various uh, various dimensions of negotiation negotiators performance uh, and uh, that would be probably a good start other than that the the shelf behind me <laughs> is full of negotiation books and there's uh, over the last 30 40 years of uh, negotiation re research there has been lots of publications let me put it like this uh, many of them are based on anecdotal evidence in other words uh, Hey, do this because when I did that, it created a, such a great impact. Or uh, do, do this because in peace negotiations 30 years ago, somebody else did that, right? So I'm, as a scientist, I am very skeptical in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, anecdotal evidence. Uh, so what we, what, we, uh, what we tend to focus or what we focused on in, in our paper was, uh, uh, was solid evidence, solid evidence uh, which can be refuted only by more solid evidence. That's the only thing that refutes science. Uh, it's not an opinion. It's not an experience. It's better science. Okay. So um, lots of uh, please feel free on the um, on the TNC, the Negotiation Challenge website. You'll find a list of books, a uh, uh, list of books that we recommend the participants uh, in terms of uh, um, in terms of helping them. Uh, prepare for uh, for our competition, but uh, even if you say, "Well, competition is not really uh, something which I'm uh, which I'm uh, looking for right now," uh, uh, you're more than welcome to read those books, anyways. Uh, they are uh, well curated, and you'll find uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it. Thank you for your recommendation. Um, the next question: How do you think do negotiation techniques change in a dig digital transformation environment? For example, are negotiations handled differently in person versus remotely? Absolutely, lots of research done on this as well. Absolutely, I think uh, we are living in a in a world that has uh, has um, uh, is facing a new um, a new normal. Yeah, it's uh, the new normal is being created. Um, and uh, in terms of negotiation, I think uh, we probably will negotiate even more than today over over electronic media. And there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, recommendations that scientists uh, have have come up with over the years in terms of uh, um, in terms of optimizing performance in such context. Yeah? And uh, let me just share a, a, a few of them. Yeah? For example. For example, seeing yourself on the screen while, while negotiating in Zoom eh, makes us more cooperative. Okay. Eh? In other words, if we mirror ourselves, and there's an ex excellent study, excellent experiment, uh, um, which address exactly this, uh, this question. Eh? If we can see ourselves in a Zoom mir mirror, we want to appear cooperative to ourselves. Eh? So uh, that's just uh, one of the things uh, um, 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 schmoozing, for example, is another thing. Schmoozing, that's, uh, that's uh, one of my favorite English words. Uh, uh, and basically, schmoozing is nothing else but uh, a um, substance-free conversation at the beginning of a relationship, something that we would say we would label as a small talk. Yeah? So teams that engage deliberately in online, in online negotiations, in small talk, yeah? Uh, tend to achieve better results, better negotiation results than those that don't. Okay? And finally, 
maybe uh, let me share a uh, last uh, thing. It's, uh, it's a huge topic on its own, highly, uh, highly relevant, uh, highly re relevant in, in, in our today's environment. Last thing, um, delaying first offers. Yes, it seems that in face-to-face -face negotiations, we, uh, we love to make first offers. We jump on uh, uh, using the benefit of the, of, of, uh, of the anchoring, eh? of the anchoring effect. But, uh, uh, but it, seems that, um, it seems that in virtual, virtual negotiations, uh, making delayed first offers uh, has, or making delayed first offers in, in general, uh, has a positive impact on the outcome. And lots of different other things. I don't want to uh, spend too much time uh, um, uh, because I, I see that we also uh, also have some other questions. Thank you. Very, very interesting. I didn't know that. Um, next question. Have you checked on related competitions using measuring scales? I was active in multiple debating competitions and in the field of debates, universal scaling systems have emerged already. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Uh, um, a good friend of mine, Peter Kesting, uh, and uh, and myself, we looked at uh, uh, we looked at competitions, uh, negotiations, comp negotiation competitions around the world, eh? and uh, we tried to uh, uh, we tried to, uh, tried to gather and collect um, um, scoring criteria, eh? and scoring mechanisms and criteria, and it seems that there is a wide variety of them. Yeah, there is a wide variety of them. Um, some of them use judges, some of them don't, some of them um, uh, rate or score negotiate negotiators based on, based on the, uh, the results. Uh, some of them add the relational aspect uh, to it. Uh, in other words, how the parties perceive the relationship between each other. Uh, lots of different stories. You'll find uh, a nice overview. Uh, you might find it, if you want to dig deeper into it, uh, you might find in, uh, in our paper on I think we called it the world championship in negotiation, yeah, and uh, where we um, uh, where we sort of uh, compared exactly this aspect, yeah, and basically this exercise showed us clearly that there is no universal standard at the moment, yeah? and that's something and this, uh, that's that is something that is long overdue, and it's something that uh, we should probably uh, we should probably focus our our attention on. Thank you. The next question kind of touches on the previous one. It is thinking about Corona and home office. Do you have any recommendations in order to successfully negotiate online? That sounds very similar to the question. I yeah, that's what I said. Is there anything in particular that you would just recommend for people negotiating online? Something you said we're more inclined to obviously be more smoothing, uh, but we may delay our offer. Is there anything else that you would recommend, um, kind of keeping in mind that we are online and you know it may be more of a negotiation online now? Anything else that comes to mind? Yes. Um, Will Baber, a good friend of mine who's also been in, involved in uh, the negotiation challenge, uh, a negotiation professor in Kyoto, uh, uh, together uh, we conducted an interesting an interesting exercise within our negotiation courses, which means uh, we taught in parallel, he in Japan, myself in, uh, in Germany, and we let, us let our students negotiate uh, uh, during our course. Okay? And uh, what we found out is that uh, the feedback from the students, and that's something that uh, science and uh, confirms, is that uh, we found out that uh, it was much more difficult to create a bond yeah? when the, the, the person I'm supposed to negotiate is not sitting next to me, yeah? is separated by thousand kilometers uh, uh, and uh, is in completely different country, it merits in completely different culture. And one of the things, uh, one of the things we address explicitly in the debriefing is uh, make sure that in such context, uh, guys, you spend enough time to compensate for the lack of proximity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why that's the reason behind schmoozing. That's the reason behind delaying or uh, delaying things. Yeah. And one can uh, we can list many many more recommendations which exactly try to address exactly this phenomenon, this shortcoming of virtual negotiations. Yeah? Relationship becomes we becomes more underestimated in such context, and that magnifies very often into uh, into um, into uh, various issues later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, how do you balance measuring short-term results and long-term impacts in terms of trust slash relationship? Do you measure a long time like a video or do you take a photo of a specific moment? Mm. Extremely important, uh, extremely important question. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for raising this. Uh, um, uh, this is something that is extremely difficult to model in negotiation competitions or in negotiation courses. And the reason is because we have a certain time frame that we can observe negotiators uh, in. Yeah? That's uh, typically, typically uh, for the competitions that we, that we run, that's typically a weekend. Yeah? In the professional competition, that would be, I don't know, four rounds uh, distributed over several weeks. Yeah? But uh, in general, in general, um, negotiators need to balance short-term gains with long-term, long-term interests. Yeah? In other words, uh, in other words, uh, in certain, in certain situations, uh, there is no future, and those are the easiest to judge. Okay? What matters is now. Okay? But in some, probably the majority, yeah, there is future. Yeah? What I do today will have an impact on my reputation and the way I would be perceived tomorrow. Okay? So I might end up with a result, but a spoiled relationship. Okay? So what we, uh, what we do in such cases, uh, which we uh, actively use in the context of the competition. Yeah? So for example, um, I don't know, uh, an investor joins a company, right? So he has, gen generically, he has two interests that uh, he or she needs to, uh, need to fulfill. One is get a good deal today. But the moment this deal spoils the relationship with the founders, yeah? He might get a great deal, but he will never be happy with it. Okay? In other words, uh, uh, we try to balance a relational and substantive outcome. And the way we do it is we let the participants evaluate each other. Okay? And that's probably the best we can do. Yeah? The best we can do in terms of capturing something that is uh, high, uh, extremely hard or difficult to capture. Yeah? That is the relational outcome. Yeah? To what extent my negotiation partner wants to deal with me in the future. Okay? To what extent my negotiation partner felt appreciated, treated fairly, felt, I don't know, there's a, less, a long list of, uh, of criteria that we are, or we want to deal with me in the future, right? Uh, and we have various scales uh, uh, for various questions. Uh, that's probably the best we can do in a synthetic context of a, of a competition. Mm -hmm. In a field study, we could probably also do more. Eh? But uh, at the moment, uh, at the moment, uh, we try to, we indeed try to combine these two dimensions eh? uh, and uh, weigh them equally. Okay, thank you. The next two questions are on the impact of cultural differences. Uh, <clears throat> A, how do your scales deal with cultural differences, and how do you adjust them? Um. Excellent question. There's uh, also a lot of uh, a very good, uh, a very good uh, friend of mine and my mentor, um, the supervisor of my PhD thesis, Jess Selick, who uh, um, did a pioneering research on capturing differences in, in intercultural negotiations. And basically what he found out already at the end of the 90s, uh, I believe, I remember correctly, that even in the context of, of um, international students enrolled in graduate programs at uh, US universities, uh, there are profound differences in the answers and long, whatever, 10 dimensions I think that we use, yeah? Uh, and, uh, and those dimensions, um, those dimensions uh, exist unquestionably, those differences exist unquestionably in negotiation. And it's so awesome to be able to observe them in, in the context of the negotiation challenge. Yeah? Um, the competition that we've ran Typically, typically raises a lot of interest in lots of different countries. Yeah? We have teams, uh, many teams from the US, lots of European countries. Uh, uh, we have Indian teams, quite a few Indian teams. We have teams from China, right? Uh, and uh, it's so amazing to see how differently they, how, how differently they tackle uh, negotiation, how, differently, how different their negotiation styles are. Yeah? And we see it 
in action in the context that matters. Okay? In a context that matters because it becomes, although negotiation challenge is at the end of the day, the price is handshake, purely symbolic, purely symbolic, but it raises so much motivation yeah, that we've had, we, we've seen people jumping for joy, people crying at the end of negotiations yeah, because they thought they were treated unfairly. Yeah? So it raises a lot of emotions, it raises a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting effects, which are, and many of them are culturally determined or culturally driven. Yeah? So, and nevertheless, we need to capture those differences or despite those differences and maybe because of them, I don't know, uh, we need to capture still the performance of our negotiators. Okay? In other words, uh, it should not matter at the end of the day yeah, for, a, for an ice skating competition or a piano playing competition, whether somebody is short or tall, comes from a collectivistic or individualistic culture and so on and so on, or was taught playing piano by one or the other or the other teacher. At the end of the day, we should be able to capture with whatever models we end up using as the universal standard to, uh, at some point, hopefully in, um, in the future, we should be able to capture to what extent he or she was better than the other person. Thank you. I just want to read out a comment. It's not a question that I thought was really nice. So Remy, I guess we all want not only a paper, but a book on really interesting impulses. And thank you for the session today. There's actually a lot of thank yous coming in. So I just wanted to read that out. Um, very interesting session, people are saying. It's uh, been an question. honor and pleasure. It's been an honor and pleasure to, uh, to, uh, to me as well. And I'm uh, so grateful that so many people showed up to listen to listen yeah. with the, uh, uh, what we have to say about negotiation. I hope some of you guys uh, uh, will sign up for, uh, for the competition and that we get to see each other at some point. In person. <laughs> in person, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, here's the next question. Do you know any good research or insights about negotiation in the context of artificial intelligence? Would you like to comment on that regard? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, uh, for raising, uh, raising this one as well. Um, uh, some of my colleagues uh, are investing a lot of their time and also, uh, also resources into designing negotiation systems. Okay? Designing negotiation systems, in other words, uh, um, helping increase, to help increase efficiency of the negotiation process by using algorithms, machines rather than uh, individuals. Okay? And uh, this research is extremely promising um, and, uh, and engaging and probably at some point when we end up with general artificial intelligence, uh, um, uh, comparable, uh, comparable to ours, uh, uh, something that at some point uh, would make us uh, uh, redundant as negotiators and me happily, happily out of job. Yeah? Uh, but uh, in general, I do believe in technology. Uh, it's my, my second passion that, I, um, that I've dealt with for many, many years is innovation. Yeah? And as somebody who is, uh, who is so passionate about innovation, I, I'm strongly convinced yeah? The technological progress, and especially in the area of artificial intelligence, uh, at some point will reach the moment where the machines will be able to solve complex, unstructured, for example, negotiating in research area. And I'm sure we will see probably later than sooner. I don't expect it to, uh, to be, I don't know, today or tomorrow, but at some point I do expect, uh, I do expect uh, um, a research to design intelligent, artificial, artificially intelligent systems that uh, um, that can negotiate just as well as we um, as we can as human beings. Very interesting. Here's actually a comment um, that you may want to agree or disagree with. Um, um, someone is saying there is a problem for people who are. Uh, non-native English speakers uh, when they're negotiating online they don't have non-verbal clues to help them compensate certain language limitations there was just a comment to probably say uh, negotiating online is very different from negotiating in person that was the comment that's correct and that's also a very a very good observation that's a very good observation that in person we can compensate with who we are how we behave right so very 
there's a very interesting research result from the 60s, uh, which is controversial, but still, um, which says that over 90% of the communication happens without words, indeed, yeah? in a nonverbal sphere. So that is how we say it, uh, rather than what we say it, right? So, uh, that's Merhavian, uh, Merhavian's paper from, I think, 67, if I remember correctly, right? So, so absolutely correct, yeah? Uh, if all of a sudden our person is reduced to the voice or voice in the head, uh, right? So that uh, impoverishes the context, yeah? the communicational context. And uh, as such, obviously has an impact on our, um, our abilities, our negotiation skills uh, as nego or our, our capacity as negotiators. Okay? So absolutely correct, uh, absolutely correct observation. Um, and I think uh, also here technology can, can offer us um, help and assistance because uh, uh, because you guys might have uh, might have heard and seen that there are more and more successful and well working products that translate spoken language on the spot mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so last year i spent uh, most of it uh, working in china and uh, and I tested many products uh, from that area as someone who uh, who uh, whose mandarin was just non-existent at the beginning. Um, it's something that uh, that I've used uh, I've used uh, quite often, quite a lot uh, while uh, while working there. Um, and yes, uh, these things are not perfect yet, yeah, especially if people are speaking fast and using I don't know uh, with an accent, using uh, uh, colloquial uh, wording. Uh, but nevertheless, I was able most of the times I was able to follow at least the meaning. Yeah, rough meaning of uh, what people were saying with these people. Yeah? So also their technology might uh, might come in handy at some point. Maybe the case so that we stop learning languages if somebody instantaneously translate. <laughs> and I still, as, as much of, uh, of a help uh, this technology is, I still believe that uh, that uh, learning a language is also is not only a part of is, is not only a communicative aspect, but also is a way of showing respect, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, to people who we are uh, merged with or who we interact with yeah. and so on. So um, absolutely, we might, we might not have to learn every language of the country that we visit, but, uh, uh, but it's, we still might, uh, might consider learning um, languages of countries that are important to us or, or, or people from those countries are important. Yeah, for sure. Next question for you. Is it possible to use a universal system of value, evaluation on a global competition, considering that values and ethics sometimes divert from one area of the world or culture to another? Let me put it like this. I see the difficulty, that's the story of my life. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the experience that we've made uh, running a global competition. Uh, um, uh, because the negotiation challenge has gathered students from all over the place. A lot, of, probably all continents, maybe except the polar ones. Uh, uh, but other than that, probably all continents, many different countries, lots of different, uh, lots of different schools. And yes, values differ. And yes, negotiating styles differ as well. Okay. Um, the question is uh, sort of, uh, um, what is the most effective way of negotiating in an international context rather mm -hmm. than within a particular culture. Okay? So I wouldn't, I'm not sure whether I would dare to go as far as to say, well, I don't know, uh, for, a, for, for a negotiation competition in China, uh, whoever organizes it must use exactly this model. No, definitely not. There might be some um, adaptation, there might be some things that, uh, that are comp completely irrelevant and other things that are more relevant. Yeah? Same goes for, I don't know, South Africa or India, right? Uh, whatever, or Greece, right? So whatever it is, whatever the country, whatever the culture, it will always be, have its specifics. Right? It will always have its specifics. Uh, and these specifics uh, um, will probably have an impact on negotiation as well. The question is only how to be effective in, um, in, uh, in a global competition, how to be, how to be, how to do a good job as, as, as negotiators. Yeah? And I think here, not only we have no other choice as, as, as 
introduce judging criteria which are universal enough for everybody participating to subscribe to. Okay? We have no other choice. Other, other than that, it's not a competition. It's a lottery. Okay? It's a lottery where, I don't know, or a beauty contest. Even beauty contest is criteria, right? So, uh, so um, every, if the consequence of defining negotiation as a skill is the necessity or the ability to measure it, okay? if we are not able to measure it, it's not a skill. Interesting. Very interesting. There's actually one last question for you and another, a couple of comments that I will read out later. The last question is, can a person lie a lot and win the negotiation challenge? Excellent question. Yeah. So uh, we have, we, in our rules and regulations, terms and conditions for the competition, we have a very explicit clause about ethics. Okay? We as organizers of, a of our negotiation competition, we want to promote ethical way of dealing with each other. Okay? And ethics is uh, also defined in our terms and conditions. Uh, that means we promote, uh, and, and not only there, if you guys look at it, look at our model, let me flip it back a little bit uh, to, uh, there you go, moral wisdom. Okay? Uh, we believe that deception, eh, that deception, that the benefits, short-term benefits of potential deception will always be offset by negative impact of some. Eh? And therefore, to promote a particular, particular negotiation style, particular way of dealing with each other, uh, we do reward teams for having not naive, but strategic way of dealing with information which is not deceptive, neither by omission or commission, yeah? uh, but it's, uh, it shows the understanding to, uh, to, to, uh, to the other party, and at the same time, does not compromise the integrity of that person. Yeah? So let me, let, let, let me summarize this. This is a very important question. Yeah? Um, yes, in certain cases, Reverting to deceit or lying in negotiation might lead to short-term gains. It might be easier. We deliberately, as organizers, we take the responsibility and want to promote an ethical way of dealing with each other. And as such, we do reward those who, who uh, act accordingly. So it is a very important point for TNC, has, has always been a very important point for TNC, and still, and still, there are many negotiators who just cannot resist the temptation. <laughs> Thank you. There's one a comment on your um, on you stretching communication and its uh, importance. Somebody was saying, "I have a friend who is very good. Who is a very good negotiator in Portuguese, but he has problems to negotiate in Spanish." So the person is saying communication is one of the most important factors to be successful. So I guess supporting what you said earlier about the language skills. Um, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then there's another note on um, online translator use in negotiation. I had a great experience in Poland with a Polish cab driver using an online translator. We didn't speak the same language. We negotiated successfully in, in brackets, I believe. Um, the set of trips we had, plus we had a tremendous time sharing funny thoughts and a good conversation during the trips. I was amazed how well this worked in negotiating and building the relationship. Absolutely, because you guys showed that you wanted to understand each other. And that's probably this often authentic wish and will to, to try to understand each other despite the differences. It's something that was a, also a story of my life in 2019 in China, right? So, uh, very difficult uh, for me as a as a stranger was always I was always uh, w walking around with a translator hoping hoping somehow to to make the link uh, but uh, the willingness and uh, the willingness to engage in the communication was typically treated uh, uh, with a warm heart response uh, typically in the vast majority of cases yeah? and that's I think uh, something that Enrique is pointing out uh, if uh, we are we manage authentically to convey hey I I'm sorry, I do not speak your language. I'd love to, but I don't, yeah? But I want to understand you, yeah? I want us to communicate. 
that's typically is uh, is genuine uh, genuine need uh, genuine will to uh, uh, to, uh, to to do that is uh, typically appreciated by the other party. Yeah, thank you. There's actually one more question that just came in. I'm going to read that out to you. How do you deal in negotiations where you have less or nothing to offer, and the other opponent is not even interested in further doing business with you? What would you do? Negotiation skills, uh, it's, uh, or teaching negotiation is not Hogwarts. It's not magic. Yeah? It, uh, you can forget about getting everything you want through negotiation. Yeah? Uh, there is something which uh, is an important part of it is uh, the balance of power yeah? and the quality of your BATMA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Yeah? So the power is a function of the quality of, of the BATMA. The, 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 the power, negotiation power is a function of the quality of the Batman. And as, as such, uh, if you have a poor alternative, yeah, um, you, might, you will probably have an extremely hard time negotiating with a 200 kilo gorilla um, standing in front of you. Right? So if someone is stronger, has a lot of alternatives, and you don't, yeah, um, there is no magic that uh, no magic uh, word or no magic spell that you can cast to make that person do what you want them to do. Yeah? There are certain influence methods, yeah? and I'd love to uh, talk about it uh, uh, with you guys at some point. So if you join HHL or I don't know, maybe uh, sign up for the competition. And uh, and uh, but uh, in general, in general, the amount of power, meaning the ability to influence other people's behavior. Uh, is not something that falls from the sky. It's a it's a function of uh, it's a function of the situation and how well we are prepared to deal with it. Thank you so much, Remy. Thank you for your entire time tonight. It was absolutely insightful. I could read out so many thank you notes um, on uh, from all sorts of people that joined us tonight. Uh, it was absolutely splendid. Thank you for your recommendation, your experience, your expertise. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I wish we could have seen each other in person <laughs> tonight. Uh, otherwise, I will send you um, a virtual round of applause from everybody. Um, also, for everybody out there, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, it was wonderful to have you. And thank you also for all your very interesting questions um, that made me think a lot about my own negotiation skills. And um, for the Export Talk series, we will have a summer break now and we'll be back after the holidays. So we will inform you about anything that's coming up. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Remy, and enjoy your night and have a lovely summer, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, guys. It was, uh, it was an honor for me to spend this time with you. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have uh, any questions anytime. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.